Homo Ludens is an anthropological essay written in 1938 by the Dutch historian and cultural theorist Johan Huizinger, in which he discusses the importance of the play element in culture and society, and argues that it is a necessary and primary condition for the emergence of culture in the first place. Hideo Kojima had stated his fascination with this idea several times in the past, but with his new title Death Stranding, he intends this school of thought to take wings. It doesn't only show in neat little nods, like Kojima Productions' new company mascot being christened Homo Ludens, but even more so in the spiritual direction he takes with the core themes of his game. In case you've seen it, you might remember how this was already a core thesis of my last video say on Death Stranding. Evolution. From the information we had at that point in time, I was convinced that Hideo Kojima's plans with this new game were, even for him, somewhat megalomaniacal. I argued how his ambition is to, to take evolution into his own hands, and not just symbolically. And Death Stranding is the vessel with which he aims to achieve that. I highlighted how the titular Homo Ludens mascot is supposed to represent the literal next level in human evolution. How with Death Stranding, Kojima doesn't solely intend to break the fourth wall anymore, like in previous titles, but then he wants to shatter it beyond any semblance of repair. The world we're entering in Death Stranding will not just be a traditional virtual game space anymore, unaware of the player's existence in the outside world, but the bilateral communication and interaction between our world and theirs will be one of the central aspects of the experience as a whole, a parallel universe into which we, the players, the Homo sapiens, will transcend into and which we are going to permanently influence with our actions by leaving our individual trail of handprints. When I say evolution, I'm not exclusively referring to the Darwinian evolution of species through natural selection here, but the evolution of all life, matter and existence, of which Darwinism is only one of the steps in the ladder of the history of the universe. Homo Ludens is the evolution of mankind through the means of play, and Death Stranding is supposed to provide the space, the breeding ground, the habitat for a newly emerged subspecies of hominy, the Homo Ludens. So much for the central hypothesis of my last video essay. Within this half hour long video, I've attempted to stitch together all the hints and clues scattered around by Kojima and his team since the first reveal in June 2016, but no matter how convincing it may have appeared, remember that it's still a theory, and an unproven one at this point. But fast forward one year after the second trailer's reveal, and we finally got another, this time almost 8 minute long story trailer. And believe me, for someone who puts their unproven theories out for everyone to see on the internet, such a reveal is always a little bit scary. Not that I'd be devastated if one of my theories would get wholly debunked, but there's always the risk that the revelation of new information will stomp my conjectures in the ground. But to my delight, this most recent trailer, let's call it the Explosions trailer from now on, pretty much right out of the bat strongly corroborated my ideas. The notion that evolution on a much grander, a cosmic scale will be one of the core themes of the story and lore of Death Stranding. The opening and closing narration by Norman Reedus, in which he mentions four explosions, is a recapitulation of the entire history of existence by iterating the progression of the four seminal cataclysmic events that result in one final event. The Death Stranding Evolution Event. Once there was an explosion. Okay, I know we're all eager to dig into the fourth and final explosion mentioned in the trailer, the Death Stranding evolution event. But in order to understand and establish its significance within the evolution of the universe, our solar system and life on Earth, especially in the context of Death Stranding, let's be thorough and go through the other explosions first. Let's play Neil deGrasse Tyson for a moment. Our universe is vast. It contains more stars than all the grains of sand on planet Earth combined. Our universe is also quite old. 
It took roughly 13.8 billion years for all matter in the universe to evolve into the present state. So what does that have to do with the first explosion mentioned in the trailer? Once there was an explosion, a bang which gave birth to time and space. It is referring to, you guessed it, the Big Bang. If we travel back in time as far as the universe is old, there were no galaxies, no stars, no planets, let alone life as we know it. 13.8 billion years ago, all matter in the universe was comprised into a fraction of the size it is today, packed so infinitely densely that nothing, not even light, could escape the enormous gravitational pull. Our universe was in a state of space-time singularity. In my first video on Death Stranding, I explained how one of Norman Reedus's dog tags showed the equation for the so-called Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius describes the size an object needs to be shrunk to in order to become a black hole, to enter a state of space-time singularity. Simply put, our universe, 13.8 billion years ago, used to be a black hole, a seed of a universe. Let's keep this in mind for now, because this will be important later. Once there was an explosion, a bang which set a planet spinning in that space. The Big Bang was the birth of our universe. The seed exploded and its infinitely compressed matter began expanding outward, ever expanding for hundreds of millions of years, until its matter slowly began to cool off, form subatomic particles, electrons and atoms that merged into gigantic clouds of primordial elements. After about 9 billion years of rapidly expanding molecular clouds, these elements eventually collapsed under their own gravity and began spinning concentrically, heating up under the increasing pressure and aggregating mass at the center. Over time, such an enormous amount of mass, pressure and heat was condensed so tightly that a nuclear fusion was triggered. This occurred billions of times in the universe, and such a reaction was also what caused the explosion that gave birth to our sun. The leftovers of the solar nebula, a disc-shaped cloud of gas and dust particles, kept orbiting the protostar. And gradually, big chunks of stardust began accreting, and over time their mass, and therefore their gravity, increased. These rocky bodies would eventually become the terrestrial planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, and Earth. Eventually, the Sun cooled off, and the Earth found itself orbiting the Sun within the small circumstellar habitable zone of our solar system, a distance where it's not too cold for water to be permanently frozen and not too hot for it to evaporate. The perfect atmospheric conditions for the generation of carbon-based life. But after its formation, it was still just a lifeless chunk of rock floating through space was still missing the essential building blocks for life as we know it. What it needed was one more bang. Once there was an explosion, a bang which gave rise to life as we know it. The third explosion is a bit trickier, because technically it could point to more than one event. How life or as Norman Reedus deliberately distinguishes it, life as we know it, originated on our planet is a question that people have been pondering for ages. From religious tales over scientific theories to explanations that border heavily on sci-fi. One leading hypothesis for the origin of life on Earth is panspermia. The idea that life as we know it did not originate on Earth itself, but was delivered from outer space. Microscopic life forms capable of enduring the hazardous effects of space, extreme heat, extreme cold and extreme radiation, trapped in debris that's ejected into space after planets and small solar system bodies that harbor life collide. 
According to the panspermia theory, an asteroid or meteorite harboring prebiotic organic building blocks of life one day, roughly 4 billion years ago, crashed into the lifeless chunk of rock, metal and water that planet Earth used to be at that point in time. Due to its ideal atmospheric conditions, the asteroid's passengers would find a home, an environment in which they could survive, thrive and begin to multiply. These proto-life forms were simple, single cellular organisms, but they harbored the life seed to bring about the genesis of sentient life, DNA. A thread-like chain of nucleotides containing the genetic instructions used in the growth development, functioning, and reproduction of all known living organisms. The programming language of life. Whenever these proto-organisms reproduced, they would copy their genetic information onto its offspring. But with every copy, tiny translation errors would lead to an altered, randomly mutated DNA sequence. It's an evolutionary lottery. If the altered sequence would bring a physiological advantage for the organism, it was more likely to survive and procreate than physiologically inferior species. Natural selection. So, fueled by the power of DNA, combined with lots and lots of time, it took another 3.5 billion years until this evolution through natural selection reached a seminal turning point. The Cambrian Explosion. Until then, evolution produced little more than bacteria, plankton, and multicelled algae. But eventually, around 541 million years ago, a sudden surge of diversity and variety in life began developing at exponential rates. In a time span of 30 million years, which scientists call the Cambrian period, all major animal body plans, from which all the species prevalent on Earth today eventually evolved, appeared in the fossil record, changing the biosphere forever. The Cambrian explosion is one of the major evolutionary events in the history of Earth, without which mankind in its current state would not have come to be. It is as vital in the cosmic history of mankind as all the other cataclysmic events described before. The Big Bang, the birth of the Sun, the accretion of the Earth, and the insemination by panspermia. So in this way, I do believe that both interpretations of the third explosion hold equal merit, as both corresponding events are seminal cornerstones in the ancestry of human life on planet Earth that can be equally regarded as fountainheads for Darwinian evolution. For our analysis, it doesn't even matter which one it is. What does matter is their allegorical significance for Death Stranding, because both cases firmly reinforce the notion that the Darwinian evolution of species is one of the central chapters in Death Stranding's timeline of the evolution of Homo ludens. A chapter that is about to be closed and put in the past when the final explosion occurs. And then came the next explosion. So here we are, with the question, what is the fourth explosion, still in the air. I believe that all the clues necessary to piece this together have already been laid out. According to Hideo Kojima, something from another world arrived, stranded in our world. And to go back to his famous sticks and ropes analogy, most of your tools in action games are sticks. You punch, or you shoot, or you kick. The communication is always through these sticks. I want people to be connected not through sticks, but through what would be the equivalent of ropes. As I pointed out in my previous videos, relation is one of the major themes of Death Stranding. The notion that everything is connected with everything. Many aspects in the trailers hint at this idea of interconnectedness, like the mysterious handprints appearing out of nowhere and leaving marks on the protagonist, the baby canisters which appear to directly fuel the players with life, Moby Dick appearing in two trailers and the Kojima Productions logo trailer, and Metal Gear Solid V. 
Things like the rainbow or circumzenithal arc that appears in the sky in the second trailer when the planetary constellation from the moon in the logo trailer shows the ideal circumstances for such a phenomenon to appear on Earth. And of course, the most obvious symbol for relation, the eponymous strands, black umbilical cords that appear to connect all life, matter and existence. We've also established that relativity is another central theme. Norman Reedus wears equations like the Schwarzschild radius describing black holes, the Dirac equation which led to the discovery of antimatter, and Einstein's field equations which is one of the cornerstones of modern theoretical physics. And we've left our investigation of the first explosion with the idea that our universe was once a black hole, a seed of a universe. But what happened before the Big Bang? What made this virtually infinitely compressed spot of space-time burst? There are various theories about the birth of our universe, but some scientists are not so sure that we've ever left the inside of a black hole in the first place. According to theoretical physicist Nikodem Popovsky, we are still and have always been nestled inside a black hole, living in our own domain of space-time, nested within a mother universe that itself is only one of many universes. And black holes may just be the passageways between them, or, as Professor Michio Kaku calls them, umbilical cords. We need a theory that goes before the Big Bang, and that's string theory. String theory says that maybe our universe is budded from another universe, leaving an umbilical cord. String theory is sometimes called theory of everything, because it attempts to model the four fundamental forces, gravitation, electromagnetism, strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force together in one theory. In the 20th century, physicists began to apply its concepts to black holes, finding that it finally provided a cohesive framework to study and attempt to resolve the paradoxes of black holes. Extremely simplified, string theory suggests that everything is connected with everything across space, matter, and time. Now if you think about the fact that there are an estimated 100 billion galaxies in our observable universe alone, that at the center of each sits a supermassive black hole with the mass of millions of suns, rotating at near light speed and sucking in matter with perpetual forces so intense that a bursting point Another Big Bang is just a matter of time. How many seeds of universes are strewn just throughout our own galaxy, each one nesting a near-infinite amount of galaxies and stars on their own? To see a world in a grain of sand. Now, when someone like Hideo Kojima writes a setting whose lore is based on the principles of theoretical physics and string theory, you can expect that he and his writers will do their research to grasp the matter several levels beyond the average layman. But that doesn't mean that we should expect hard science fiction with MIT-level scientific accuracy. The ideas we'll find in this game will likely take theoretical physics as a jumping point and use their ideas allegorically. In Death Stranding's world, string theory is what fueled the Death Stranding evolution event, when humans found a way to traverse the connection between universes through umbilical cords, through black holes. At one point in time, humanity achieved a fundamental breakthrough. The apex of thousands of years of scientific progress, turning theoretical physics practical. Humanity unlocked dimensional exploration, the means to travel across parallel universes through black holes and closing the gap between realities. They formed an organization that would connect a virtually infinite amount of universes, that would build bridges across the multiverse. 
each parallel universe unfolding after their own timeline of individual evolution, like a computer algorithm that ineluctably approximates their own apex of evolution, their own death-stranding evolution event. But with an endless amount of realities to tap into, eventually there was bound to be a bad apple. One day, something from another world arrived. Something came from a mother universe whose inhabitants feed on uncountable other realities, hungrily and mercilessly, consuming and devouring the lives and fates of souls across dimensions, inexorable like rapture. It is, it's us. We're the something that came from that other world. Our intrusion is the fourth explosion. We're the viewers, the readers, the listeners, and the players. We've been doing it for generations. We consume the fates and lives of imaginary people for personal gain, pleasure, wisdom, enjoyment, through tales, make-believe, through story. We're the audience that assumes control over the inhabitants of other realities through imagination. In Death Stranding, this is happening literally. We impact countless fates via minuscule strands of energy vibrating across 11 dimensions. That's how string theory would put it. Or how Death Stranding sees it, cosmic and eldritch umbilical cords. As an audience, we've been tapping into the lives and fates of characters all across the multiverse for millennia. And we've taken control over video game characters from the comfort of our couch for decades. If you think about it, that's what video games can be for many of us. A temporary escape to another reality. In Death Stranding, humanity found a way to bridge these realities through science. So in this setting, we're not just gonna be the invisible, godlike puppeteers hiding behind an impenetrable fourth wall for the actors. Each one of us will individually directly enter the world of Death Stranding through our console and join in on the fight against the adversary. Not just an avatar, literally you. <laughs> I was like, all right. And then he goes, he goes, and I go, playing me? And he goes, no, they'll be you. And I was like, if you think about it, in the three trailers we've seen so far, we've had three characters who break the fourth wall. And that is very much on purpose. The first one is Guillermo del Toro, looking nervously into the camera, acknowledging the audience in front of the screen. Now, Guillermo is not a professional motion-capturing actor. His presence, as well as multiple remarks by himself, Kojima, and other members of Kojima Productions in the past, insinuate that this character is actually supposed to be Guillermo del Toro, our reality's Guillermo del Toro, and he is aware of the outside world, just like a player is always aware of their surroundings, most of the time. On his chest he's wearing the Bridges badge, meaning he is a player who's entered Death Stranding's reality, became a member of Bridges and joined the fight against the adversary the invaders of the Death Stranding evolution event. Next up, there is Mats Mikkelsen's character. It's been confirmed that he's going to be one of the game's antagonists, likely the leader of the five monolithic floating figures seen in the other trailers. He directs, no, he outright controls the Skull Soldiers via strands that look suspiciously like electric cables like a player's connection to their video game characters, sending signals through the cable of their input device. He looks us straight in the eye, fully and impishly aware of our presence. Hush, don't spill the beans. He is not a part of Bridges, but he's part of the adversary, either invading Death Stranding's reality from our world or from another, darker mother universe. My guess is that the game will feature something comparable to an invasion system from the Soulsborne series, in which the players will take on the role of antagonists as well, from time to time. One of the things that indicates that is that all the devices, all the creatures, all the characters in some way are connected to strands, like the planes, like the tanks, like the crabs and the whales, and many other things. 
everything is connected, everything is controlled. But that's... I can't prove that yet. What we do know is that Mats knows. He knows that we're behind the screens. And with that I mean Mats' character, not Mats himself, because he seems to be quite clueless what Kojima is scheming. Just like Norman Reedus too, or everybody else. And lastly, the baby. It is featured in every trailer so far, but in the last one we see it inside of Norman Reedus' belly. Which finally puts the scars we see in the first trailer on his belly into perspective. In this one, the baby gives the viewers a thumbs up, as well as horrible Mprek nightmares. <laughs> Mm. And this is us. The baby is a constant throughout all three trailers, and if you think about it, it is, in some way, present, one way or another, all the time. It is each player's personal incarnation in Death Stranding's world, and the characters we meet and play, they're aware of that. It's our connection through which we take over the action, the characters. We're literally gonna be born into this world, the baby being the vessel through which our consciousness and intelligence transcends into the bodies and minds of this world's inhabitants. Yeah, Death Stranding's story is more confusing than Birmingham Spaghetti Junction in the dark. And this video might probably have made it even more confusing than it felt before. I'm sorry, but if anything else, to me, this new trailer strongly reinforced the ideas that I brought up in my previous videos. The notion that we are directly entering Death Stranding's universe to have a permanent impact on this world through our thoughts, actions, and interactions with it and its inhabitants. In Death Stranding, humanity has found a way not only to bridge a multitude of universes together, they also found a way to tap into our intelligence and channel our thoughts into their reality, instrumentalizing video gamers into a collective consciousness. Something, something human instrumentality project? Is it mean of me to jump off at a point like this? Almost like a cliffhanger? Who knows, maybe I'll come back to it in another video. Who knows? There are probably a plethora of ideas that are swirling in your mind right now about how Death Stranding might implement these notions in practice, and I'll be frank, it's the same for me. As convinced as I am that the eponymous strands in Death Stranding will be something like an allegorical representation of a multiverse connected through umbilical black holes, and as convinced as I still am that we, ourselves, are supposed to become permanently part of Death Stranding's virtual multiverse, there is literally no way for me to say with certainty how these elements will be implemented into the actual game. And that's fine, because as the maker said, we are already playing it. The game, that is. We're already contributing to the collective consciousness, are an active part of the Death Stranding evolution event by sharing our thoughts and ideas in this alternate reality-like scavenger hunt. So I'd honestly love to hear your ideas. How will the game play out? How will Hideo Kojima rewrite the way we experience death in video games incorporated in a science fiction action open world game? So by all means, participate in the comments, I'm looking forward to it. Before I go, I would like to thank everyone who supports my channel on Patreon. Without the help of my patrons, I wouldn't be able to keep doing these videos, so thank you! And if you're thinking of helping out and pitching in yourself, I'd be very grateful, so feel free to follow the link in the description of this video. And this month, I'd like to give out a special thank you to Arcel Markison, John Boring, Quentin Prodome, Thwagum, Travis Deng, Evan Tekre, Kiri Starhaku, Adam Burr, Lucas, Murat Casardis, James Lynch, Robin Clausen, Aaron Doodles, Cleish Hiai, Garrett Lathy, Vida Daly, Ian Oblivion, Malum, Matt Davis, Julia, David Nadeau, The Melting Squad, Simon Chomsland, Sean Quigley, Sean Holiday, Angrim, Roman Wasenmüller, Nathan DeGrand, Alex Lake, Kalas Spilari, Siri Agnath Eliasson, 
Augustin Ortega, Jason Johns, Brand Ruppert, Morrigan, Maxwell Brown, Subject Matter Games, Max Herbert, Bruzov Jones, David Zelenak, Karl Jura, Martin Schmidt, Konrad Kurze, Brian Vieira, Adam Cross, Matthew Daly, Sonny Mellard, Michael Smyna IV, Travis Leneve, Jordan Farrell, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Mr. Bergadon, Matthias Fowler, Decim, Rational User, Philip Kirchner, Mido Reno, Chase Ladner, Pascal Fairling, Milan Vujinovic, Yasin Inat, Andrei Kriakushin, Sebastian Garcia, Jacob Woodward, Dmitry Pirak, Luke Johnson, Danny Sendel, Chaco Pereira dos Santos Silva, Carlos Vega, Marisa Martinez, and Nicholas Stevenson. Thank you for watching. Ta-ta!